Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Benner. And I'm Brent Blazik. And we'd like to talk today a little bit about writing testable code and we're designing code for testability. So what we'd like to do in this presentation is discuss what we do we mean by code that is testable and what the benefits of it are to show how design principles, specifically the solid design principles, can help ensure that your code is written testably, introduce some different design patterns that can help with this, and briefly touch on the concept of test-driven development. So, we've all been there. We've all been looking at a JIRA case as add a new feature to this code. So we take the case, and we open up the code, and the first thing that comes, to our comes out of our mouth is, well, I'm not gonna say what that is because we're a family show here. It's impossible to know where to start. Okay, the code is just jumbled. You can't even begin to know where to start. So you fire up your editor and you start digging into it and you start adding features and fixing bugs. But every time you fix a bug over here, three more fire pop up over here. And the next thing you know, you're in the middle of a 26 day work week, wondering if maybe a career in de demolishing buildings with explosives might be a little less stressful. <laughs> yes, that actually happened to both of us, <laughs> seriously. The 26 day work week is not an exaggeration. Um, what you've run into is the fact that this code was so badly designed and hard to test. This, this type of code has three main hallmarks. It's rigid, it is very hard to change. When you do change it, it's fragile, it breaks in places that you even, don't even know why it broke there. And it's opaque, it's hard to understand. You don't know what's going on unless you become a human compiler and walk through the code by hand. Yeah, so what then is good design and what's testable design? So we wanna look at, I'm gonna borrow this clicker right here. Good code is, is a module that is isolated. It can stand on its own, it's independent. Kind of like a puzzle piece. A puzzle piece on itself can be by itself. It provides a well-defined interface. It doesn't expose a lot of uh, details. It exposes behavior. What is the behavior that I have? And it consumes the same from the, from the components that it uses. It wants to understand and consume the behavior of those components not understand their internal workings. That reduces coupling. We all know that coupling is bad. So why is this important? Well, we've all been exposed to um, the idea that we have to be agile. If we want to survive as developers, if we want to survive as a company, we have to be able to respond to changing requirements and, and the differing needs of our customers. So we want to increase agility. Good code that is agile, I'm gonna suggest, can anticipate change. It's ready for change. Good code slows the, the code rot. Brad talked about it being fragile. Fragile code is when it changes in, you, uh, in unexpected ways. Code that changes in unexpected ways nobody wants to work on, so they don't touch it. How many of us have been in a situation where we're like, uh, yeah, we're not gonna make that change because I ain't touching that code. Right, yeah, we've all been there, right? And, and I think the term rot is really good because it does, it starts to stink and you just don't wanna be there. So code that is well designed slows that code rot because it can handle that change and removes the fragility. Code that is well designed is easier to maintain. We talked about opaqueness, it's hard to understand. If your code well is well articulated in these are the things that we expect to change, these are the behaviors we expect to stay the same because they follow business rules or follows the, this algorithm, that's a lot easier to understand, especially if you have tests that back that up, that expose those differences in the things that are the same. And that's an important part. Above all, we wanna see that code that is easy to test actually does get tested that we have automated tests behind it because that shortens our feedback loop of whether or not we did break anything. Was there something fragile that we didn't expect that now is exposed um, through our automated tests failing? This is a quote that we saw a while ago that I thought is rather pertinent. It says, if our designs are failing owing to the constant reign of changing requirements, it's our designs and practices that are at fault. We can't blame marketing, we can't blame the customer. It's about us. 
So if we, count, if we come back and say, you know, our code just can't do that, we really need to take a hard look at whose fault that is. Not that we want to assign blame, but let's assume responsibility appropriately. Okay, so how can we make sure, how can we make sure then that our code is not fragile and is agile and maintainable and doesn't rot? One way to do this is to keep in mind some design principles. These are um, five principles. They were originally promulgated by Uncle Bob, Bob Martin, um, and they were gathered into this, this grouping uh, by Michael Feathers of, of um, working with legacy code fame. And he calls them the solid principles. And if you keep these five principles, these, these five princ design principles in mind as you're working with your code, chances are really good that you will have good, well-designed code. They are, and I'll get in, we'll get into them in more uh, detail, the single responsibility principle, the open-close principle, Liskov substitution principle, the interface segregation principle, and the dependency inversion principle. Taken together, that forms the acronym SOLID. Keep that in mind, and you'll keep those in mind too. So we wanted to put together an example of some of these principles, how they can be violated, and, and how we think that you can overcome them. It's a contrived example, so forgive us. Um, and it's, it's not going to be perfect, but it's a, it's a start. So we're going to go over here to some code. We have a bicycle. And for, let's see, for, I was trying to see if this has a pointer on it. I don't, I don't know if it does. Oh, no, look, it does little button, dotty things up there. That's cool. All right. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know where the pointy thing is, but we'll go with this. All right. So we have our bicycle, and it's a very simplistic representation of bicycle. We have a front wheel. We have a back wheel. We only care about the front wheel because I don't know why. Um, <laughs> And then uh, the front, the bike can stop. We have the front wheel, we apply the pressure to the rim, and we stop turning. And we've got a wheel, and it turns, and it applies pressure, and it stops turning. So that's our example. So imagine that. Um, let's go back here. But as we deal with all the time, we have a new requirement, which says, you know, our customers need a different way of doing bikes, of stopping their, bike, their bikes. So we have caliper brakes. That's kind of what we've implied on this previous example. Now they want to get really high tech and, uh, and do um, disc brakes. Well, one of the problems that we see is that the wheel kind of does too much to make this happen. It has two purposes. Motion, it turns and it stops, and how it stops. Now that's something that goes back to the single responsibility principle, which says a class or module should have, if I'm bouncing around, sorry about that, a class or module should only have one reason to change. We call it an axis of change. And so it only has this one vector under which it changes. So let's take a look at some code on that. And if you can get to two for me, I'd be grateful. Can you see? There we go. All right. So now we modified the code such that uh, we eliminate that problem. We, we take the stopping mechanism out of the wheel and we put it into a brake. And so now in our bicycle, we've got a caliper brake, we've got a front caliper brake, and that applies the pressure to whim of the front, of the front wheel. And so now we're good. We've separated that the wheel does one thing, it moves. The brake does one thing, it stops the wheel. So that helps us to uh, get down to a testing point that we can test caliper brake independent of a bike. And we can test a wheel independent of a brake. And it helps us to focus in on what's the concern that we have for this class or module. My, yep, I need to flip over, sorry guys. All right, next problem. A change in the brake causes a change in the bike. Did you see that? We had to change the brake. And to do that, the braking mechanism, we have to go into the, to the bike code to make that change. Now that's a violation of what we call the open-closed responsibility. The open-closed responsibility says that a class or a module is open for extension, but closed for modification. Now, if you're anything like me, 
That's probably going through your mind, right? What? That makes no sense. But it actually does. The intent is that we write the code such that the axis of change is extensible without modifying the code in the future. The idea is that if you have to change the code for the same reason more than once, you've got an axis of change. And you ought to figure out how to extract that out, those modifications out. We can show you an example of what that looks like in something called the strategy pattern. Now, probably a lot of you have used this. If you don't recognize it by name, you've probably already used it and maybe didn't even note it. A strategy is a behavioral pattern that's in the Gang of Four book. And it basically says to define a family of algorithms, e encapsulate each one, and make them interchangeable. So let's take a look at what that would look like inside the code. And we need to go to three. Thank you, Bradrick. All right, so we now have a bicycle. It takes a brake. We developed an interface called brake. We know that changing the stopping mechanism is an axis of change for bicycles. So we can write the bike code and we can lock it down. Imagine that that bike code was somewhere that you couldn't even change it. Well, how do you modify it? So we, inter we developed this interface called brake. And now we, have, we can do disc brakes. We can do caliper brakes. You can come up with any brake that you want. You can have the little brother brake where he grabs on the back of your tire. You throw him off, and he, he drags along until you stop. There's lots of options for you. It doesn't matter. But we can extend bike, the functionality for bike, without ever changing the code. We just add new code. And that's one thing I want to suggest to you. Look for ways to add new code rather than modify code. If you're anything like me, I hope you're not exactly, but I would much rather work on new code, my own code, than I would like even as good as Brad is going to Brad's code and modify it, because I don't think the same way that Brad does. So that's the principle of open close, is figure out a way that you can modify your, extend your code without modifying it. Now, let me just jump in here for a second. I want to, I want to, I want to interrupt the program here, give a little time out. Um, one thing that you noticed in that last code example was that we started introducing interfaces. This is a very good thing to do. Why is that? We're going to, run it, we're, we're going to take these a little out of order here, and we're going to talk about something called the dependency inversion principle. What dependency inversion principle states from the book is that high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules, but instead both should depend on abstractions, on interfaces. Okay, so as an example, um, this is probably the traditional pattern that most of us learned in school when we were learning OO design or if we were self-taught. You have a policy layer that depends on a lower level layer, which depends on a lower level layer that goes in its turtles all the way down. Um, the problem is, is that this can induce coupling that you don't know about. Okay, so for instance, I could make a change in that utility layer, that lowest level layer, and it could have ramifications up in policy that I don't know about and makes it hard to test. Instead, what the dependency inversion says is that the layers should depend on abstractions. So the policy layer instead should depend on this policy interface, okay? That then the mechanism layer provides for that. It provides the implementation of that. Where the term dependency inversion comes in, and then let me tell you, this, this one, this one kind of blew my mind a little bit. and it, I'm st I had a hard time wrapping my brain around it when I first ran into this is that it's the policy that de defines the interface. The policy layer defines the interface, not the mechanism layer, not the lower layer. The policy layer says, this is what I want to do. And the mechanism layer says, fine, I will provide that functionality for you. Okay, so it really takes that, that thinking of object-oriented design and turns it on its head, it inverts it. And it's, again, it's, it's really, it was really tough for me to wrap my brain around, so don't feel bad if, it, if you're still going, huh? Really, really. It, is, it, is, it is a much different way of thinking about it. 
this way, but by doing this, this makes it much easier to test our code because now policy, I can inject mocks, I can inject spies, doubles, whatever into that policy layer, control the behavior, control the outcome of the tests, and make sure that it's behaving the way I want it to. Okay? So now, we have a new requirement that comes in. Okay, so we have wheels. Bikes have wheels. What kind of wheels do we want? Well, the customer wants to be able to put different types of wheels on their bikes. Maybe a nice, big, fat um, um, mountain bike wheel, a skinny little racing wheel, whatever. Okay? So with, whoops, where'd it go? Where am I? There we are. There, there we are. So now with dependency inversion, we can say, on the right, is that the right file? Yeah, that is, okay. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we were in the right place. That now, the bicycle says, well, here's what I want for a wheel to do, okay? And it's up to the wheels types, like the tubed wheel. We have this wheel interface, in this case, it's an abstract class. The tube wheel says, well, I can provide these, these functionality. The tubeless wheel says I can do this functionality. The solid wheel does this functionality. We're injecting that dependency into the bicycle class itself. We're not, we're not, we're not newing up wheels in the bicycle. We're saying where the wheel, the, excuse me, the bicycle gets that wheel injected into it, okay? Then we kind of, if you look at this, we kind of run into another small problem. Okay, so we, we inject, a, we go ahead and we add a solid tire to the bicycle. And we say, well, what's the air pressure of that solid, of that solid tire? It, uh, what? Okay, what does that mean? Do I return a zero? Do I return a hundred? Do I throw an exception? What do I do in that case? It doesn't have air. This is, this, is a, this is a case of a violation of what's called the Liskov substitution principle. This, was pro this is the only one actually named after a person. Uh, Barbara Liskov uh, formulated this one back in 1987, back in the Dark Ages. And what, basically what it says is that if you have any subtypes or any implementations of interfaces, you should be able to substitute them for that base type or that interface and there will be no change in behavior of the client code, okay? So basically what this, what this says is we're enforcing a contract between modules. If I have a tire, I expect, as a bicycle, I expect to say, I want to get the air pressure and I should get something back that's consistent, whether it be a uh, mountain bike tire, whether it be a racing tire, whatever kind of tire it is, I should be able to get that, that back. It's a semantic contract. If we violate that like we do, say, with the um, airless tire, that means that now all of a sudden the bicycle code has to become a little more type aware. It has to be able to say, well, now I need to know how to deal with an airless tire. Okay, we've just introduced another thing that needs to be tested. We've just increased our test burden. We've increased the opacity a little bit. We've increased the fragility a little bit. Okay. So LSP can be pretty subtle. You have to really kind of watch out for it. Another problem with that last code is, you notice, if you remember, one of the methods of the wheel class was to tighten the spokes. Bicycles don't care about tightening the spokes. Okay, all the bicycle knows is that the wheel's supposed to be there, it goes around and it stops. It's up to the rider to determine whether the spoke is loose and whether it needs to be tightened. Okay, this is, the, um, this is an example of what's called the interfa interface segregation principle, excuse me, which basically says that no client should be dependent on methods or properties that it doesn't need to use. So if we go back to our example, there we go. Oh, wrong button, there we go. You can see that we've broken up that wheel interface a little bit more. We have, excuse me, separated out methods and properties that the bicycle doesn't really need to care about. 
So we notice that instead, all the bicycle cares about is that the wheel can turn and it can stop. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. Whereas a maintainable wheel, which may be something that a rider wants to worry about, provides the tightening spokes. Whereas an inflatable wheel, again, we can um, uh, change the PSI, change the, get the air pressure, whatever. So what this does is this allows us the splitting of this interf these interfaces into smaller chunks. Basically cuts down on the number of interfaces, of the m number of methods in an interface that you need to mock out when you're testing. So it makes your tests that much easier. So if you, but the, the downside is that if you add more methods to that interface, say we add another method to the wheel interface, that means that now the client code has to change, we have to add more tests, increases the burden, increases all of that other bad stuff that we talked about earlier. So interface segregation, splitting the, your interfaces into smaller and smaller chunks just providing just what's needed by the client in your interface. Okay. Now, one, one, thing, one thing to keep in mind about these is these are just principles. Okay, these are principles that you should keep in the fore of your mind when you're working on your code. They're not laws that have been scribed on stone, brought down from the mountain, and the code police will arrest you if you um, violate them. Okay. You can violate them. You should know why you're violating them, though. Um, if there's a possibility of change, so you know, don't worry about it. it if, if there's no possibility for change, excuse me, don't worry about it. If, I'm not saying go out tomorrow or t after this, go out, r run through your code base, and rewrite your entire code base to uh, you know, follow these principles. No, don't do that. Please don't do that. But if you're going to make a change, if you have to fix a bug or you have to add a new feature, keep these principles in mind. So if you're going to, so if basically what I'm saying is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if you're going to fix it, fix it the right way, using these principles, keeping these principles in front of mind. Okay. So let's keep talking uh, through our example. Um, so Brad's done a good job of finishing up all the various principles that we're that we were identifying, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some patterns that help us help us to uh, adhere to these principles. And so let's continue this example that says, you know, our customers come back and say, well, now not only do they want to change the type of brakes that they have, and they want to change the different tires that they have, but they want to add an optional brake light. Well, we can do that. That's no problem. Let's switch over to our code and see if I can find it. Oh, there's my mouse, and we're right there, right? Okay, that is really hard to navigate. We've learned something, right? Okay, so I'm gonna try it. Woohoo! look at that. Okay, we've got our bicycle. We have our interface of brake. We've learned. We also wanna depend on another interface, our brake light. Cool, all right, so we've got that, we're learning. So now we stop. And we say, OK, if brake light is not equal null, then we're going to go ahead and shine that while we're stopping, and then we're going to apply our front brake. That's all good, right? Nothing wrong with that. Oh, Scott says, no, <laughs> no, that's not good. Why isn't that good? Because it violates the open close principle. We extended bike by modifying it. So here's a way that you can extend code without modifying the consumer. It's called the decorator pattern. And uh, the intent is to add responsibilities to an object dynamically. And it's generally used in, with composition for the specialization. Let's, let's take a look at the code and see what that would look like. We're going to go back up here, right there. OK. So what we have is we put bicycle back where it needs to be. It's got a brake, and it's got a wheel, and it just stops. We have our interface brake. We have an interface of brake light because we want to use well-defined interfaces. And now we have an object called brake with light. It's our decorator. It takes a brake and it decorates it with a brake light. And so when there we go. All right. It implements the brake interface so we can pass it into the bicycle. And when the apply method is called, here we shine our light 
and we apply our brake. Now we've been able to extend the bicycle code without modifying it. We've also been able to extend the brake code without modifying it. That's a good thing. We could continue to add on. Let's say that you want to have an annoying siren come on when you put your brakes on. We can add another decorator to it because again, it's going to implement a brake light, a brake interface. You can pass, pass that in here instead. You can chain these things together and do all kinds of decorating without modifying any code. Everything is now working with new code. It's just how you assemble it. So that's a decorator pattern. Let's go to another problem that we have. Assembly, how do we take all these things and put it together? Let me just say right now, if you don't already know this, which probably most of you do, new is not your friend. New is a bad thing. New couples, it makes couples. Now, couples aren't bad like I love my wife dearly, right? <laughs> okay, so that's not a bad thing, or like if you're hooking up your friend with another friend, that's all good. But in your code, you don't want it coupled because code is kind of snobbish. It likes to live by itself. It has lots of cats. It's going to grow old and die, right, by itself. <laughs> That's what we want, right? So we don't want to use new. That's where dependency injection and those types of things, IOC containers, those come in. Other options that we have are things like factories. Now, you've probably used a factory or you've used a, a builder. This is a pattern called a, temp or a factory method, which it basically says define an interface for creating an object, but let subclasses decide which classes to instantiate. We talked about the decorator. It uses composition for specialization. The factory pattern here, or the factory method pattern, uses an inheritance for specialization. All right, so it's just a way to contrast those two different methodologies. And let's go back here to our code and show you what that looks like. So we have uh, our bike factory. We have a method called create a bike. And it has to create a frame, create a wheel, create brakes, and put it all together. That's our algorithm. We have a protected method of create frame. And we have a default implementation there. Then we have two abstract methods of create a wheel and create brakes. And so then let's say that we have the fat tire bike factory, which it creates when it calls create wheel, creates a big fat wheel, and uh, or creates a big fat tire and puts a rim on it. Or the other way around, excuse me. We also have a racing bike factory, which we decided that, OK, racers, um, they like things really light. And up here, we're making all of this out of just the heaviest gauge steel that we can because it's generally for, I don't know, six-year-olds that break their bikes. So they say, no, we don't want that frame. We're going to create our own. That's good. We didn't change the bike factory. We're just going to create our own frame, and then we're going to create other wheels. And we can continue this on. We can put together all, other, all kinds of other factories. And then our bicycle looks like this. It takes a frame, it takes a front brake, it takes a wheel, and we're all fat, dumb, and happy. We didn't have to change bicycle anymore. But now we have the ability to create different factories. And then we can give those factories to clients of bikes and say, well, you need, when you need a bike, just call you know, create bike up here on this factory, and it'll give you what you need. And we know because we're, we're working with a well-defined interface, we know that all you care about is making the bike go, stop and start. Your stop method, you don't care how it's implemented, whether it's got disc brakes, whether it's got a brake light or anything else. You just care that it's stopped. So it's a way to abstract out that functionality, separate your concerns, and make sure that you're dealing with the things that you want to deal with. So that's a few patterns, a lot of design principles. Let's touch very briefly on test-driven development. Because one of the ideas I hope that, uh, or rather we hope that, five minutes, thank you, Rob. One of the things that we hope you get out of this is the idea that if we build software from the top down, which is the dependency inversion principle, so many of these things, these other principles, single responsibility, interface segregation, open close principle. They fall right in line. Because we're taking it 
from the top and saying, this is where my logic is, this is where my business rules are, this is what I need to support that. Test-driven development helps to enforce that. Because the idea, if you haven't used test-driven development, and this is very brief, we could do a whole segment on test-driven development, is that you start by writing a test. In other words, you start by saying, this is what I need the functionality to do. And then you write code that satisfies that. And as soon as you start figuring out, wow, I need a bike to stop, but I, you know, the bike's not responsible for stopping the wheel. I need a brake that does that. Wow, now I have an interface I can develop. I can develop a brake interface. I can write a mock object. Now I'm fat, dumb, and happy. And everything continues on. Now I can figure out what to do about brakes and put them all together. So test-driven development is a great way to help these um, principles remain in your code. It's not easy. It's really challenging to write tests first. It's a different way of thinking. So. In conclusion, we've just been able to give you some introduction to terms and principles. Um, we will say, generally, you want to fi favor composition over inheritance. Most of the patterns that you'll work with do that. Um, and of course, if we can, let's favor adding new code rather than changing code. And so now we'll turn it to questions, and we might even have an answer for you. We might make stuff up, too. Please. Yes, thank you, Rob. Yeah, the question was, should a class's collaborators be an interface all the time? In a puritanical sense, yes. Now, that was a very interesting experience for me because I came from a C-sharp background, and we used interfaces for everything. And when I came to Clearwater, um, my team had a different opinion of that because generally, because it is possible that you would have an interface and just one implementation, and that was kind of different. But the idea in a puritanical sense is, yeah, you depend on, depend, your, your classes depend on abstractions, not concrete implementations. Please, Scott. Yeah, I have a similar question, I guess. Like, if you were to go about building some new thing like this from scratch, and you had a really simple requirements, and you don't really know how it's going to grow, mm -hmm. That's a really good question. You mind if I take that one real yeah. quick? OK. So because, uh, what's that? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, so the question is, is when you're starting out and you're writing new code, do you take all this into account? And the answer is no. Because you suffer from Yagni, right? You ain't going to need it, potentially. So what you want to look at is the adage of fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And that is, if I get into code, there's no reason for me to anticipate change. That's a little bit difficult. But when I have to change the code one time, then I might want to look at how do I make this easier to change in the same way next time, right? And so then we start to put things together. But let's, it's kind of like optimizing code. We don't need to overly optimize the code early on because it may be unnecessary. So it's really about handling change. That's what all of these are about, is how do you make your code easier to change? But if you don't have that change, there's no reason to do it. Go ahead. I think you, you were first. Um, so you guys talked a lot about writing code, um, but not a lot about uh, documentation. Um, I feel that many times I have a problem with testing code because I don't know what it's supposed to do. Um, so, you know, all the principles can help simplify a lot of stuff. So it's a lot simpler to understand. But still, I, too often I find like, I don't know what this method is supposed to do or all the you know, preconditions. What, what do you have to say about that? Okay, so the question was basically, oh, sorry. Yeah, so the question was basically, where'd you go? There you are. Um, you know, what about documentation of the code? How do I know what the code does before I go in and change it, right? Um, that's where, again, the um, one, one thing that can help you are good unit tests. One of the things about unit, good unit tests is they act as documentation. Um, there have been numerous times, if you've got good unit tests, where during a code review, I'll say, don't show me your code. 
I don't care what the code does. Show me what the unit test does. Show me how it's supposed to behave. Okay, now in the absence of that, yeah, that makes it a little more difficult. A good, in the absence of good unit tests, it makes it a little more difficult to do that. So, but the concept of test as documentation is a very uh, powerful one. Time's up. We need to oh. keep on. Okay, thanks. Come, come grab us after. We'll take it offline. All right.